Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! So, a series of stark economic warnings from David Cameron this morning, who says he might not be able to protect spending on pensions, the NHS and defence if the UK votes to leave the EU. The Prime Minister said the strain on public finances caused by Brexit would even threaten the triple lock, which guarantees rises in the state pension. Here is David Cameron talking to Andrew Marr earlier. The fact is, if we did face a 20 to 40 billion black hole uh, in our public finances, we'd have to make difficult choices. And our pensions promise is based on a growing and succeeding economy. And all of the experts, and I agree with them, and the, most people in business agree, if we leave the single market, if we cut ourselves off okay. from the most important market, our economy will be smaller, and that has consequences. Cabinet Minister, Leader of the House on the Leave side, Chris Grayling joins us now. If the Prime Minister is saying we vote to leave, he cannot in effect implement key parts of the 2015 manifesto. What legitimacy would your government have to continue? Well, I mean, I don't buy the argument. You have to remember the Prime Minister, I'm afraid so. I completely disagree with him on this. It is only about six months since he was telling us if we chose to leave the European Union, we'd do fine, we'd do well. And it's also worth saying that this figure, 20 to 40 billion, if you look what it's actually based on, analysis by the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, it assumes the powers, pound goes down, uh, making our exports cheaper, but people buy fewer of them, which makes no sense. It also assumes that we lose the ability to sell within Europe, when the reality is we buy far more from the rest of Europe than they do from us, and it would cost French and German and Italian and Spanish jobs if they don't carry on trading normally with us. Uh, the, the Prime Minister, uh, he may be right or he may be wrong, but is it not remarkable that he should say, uh, if you vote to leave, all the things I promised I would do if you elected me, the key things, defence, the NHS, uh, the triple lock on pensions, that's all off the agenda. Well, I'm very surprised he's chosen to, to use those examples. I don't believe that's right. I don't believe we would back away from our manifesto promises, and I don't believe we'd need to, because I think the economic statistics behind the figures he's quoted this morning just don't hold up. They are in, include some really inherent contradictions and some assumptions of doom and gloom. When I say, you know, we buy more from the rest of Europe than they buy from us, they're going to want to carry on trading in the UK market. But if we did leave... And if there was a downturn, because of uncertainty, it may not be long, may not be deep, but if there was a downturn, that would hit the public finances, wouldn't it? It would mean tax rises, more public spending because of the extra welfare, because of unemployment, or a combination of both and more borrowing. There is a danger there. Well, it's, it's the if. I mean, you have to remember it's only two months since the governor of the Bank of England said that the biggest threat to the UK economy was the situation in China. Uh, and indeed, if you look at what some of the international bodies have been saying, when we've heard from all about the IMF, which got its figures so badly wrong two years ago, it had to apologise to the Chancellor. But the chief economist of the World Bank has says he thinks our trade will improve, our trade situation will improve, we'll sell more if we leave the European Union. What do you make of the Prime Minister's strategy this morning to come up with this? Well, um, there's a certain level of sheer panic in his eyes, if you look very, very closely, <laughs> amid the uh, tiredness, because we had learned today he's done 357 media appearances as part of this referendum campaign. I think that what he is trying to do is to take on the argument that Chris and the Leave campaigners are making around migration, saying to people, we know you're really worried about your borders, you know you want to close them, and you want to do it because it's affecting your livelihoods. Well, the Prime Minister is trying to say, actually, there's something else here that might affect your livelihood, and really trying to get into the idea that it's going to affect people's lives. But even to the extent of saying all the things I promised you, key things on defence spending, extra money for the NHS, the triple lock on pensions, all the things that probably got him elected, or were yep. a key part in it, 
He's prepared to say, I can't do yes, but any of that. But he's just breaching even more of the trust of the British people. Bear, bearing in mind also another key pledge he made in uh, election was he was going to get uh, immigration down to tens of thousands. Look, you know, he knows he's broken that, and he's broken it because of the EU uh, and, and uh, other failings in immigration policy. The, the reality is they are so desperate now in Downing Street because they, they thought they'd be ten points ahead at this point. Now, it's still very close, and if you're going to put your home on it, you'd still say, remain, uh, or going to edge it on the day as we stand right now. But they're so desperate, he's even deployed his own wife, Sam Cam, who doesn't really get involved in politics. She was never that keen, even on turning up at uh, the uh, party you know, uh, <laughs> conferences and doing the old kiss on stage. Uh, and he's actually got some, someone at Downing Street to write an article in the Mail on Sunday uh, from Sam Cam. That's how desperate they are, which I think is very telling. When I spoke to the Chancellor on Wednesday night on the BBC One interview, and I raised the business of pensions, I said to him, why would the state pension uh, be hit either way, in or out, because we have the triple lock. So, by definition, it cannot fall in real terms, in or out. And, and he actually didn't really dispute that. He, he went, pretty much went along with that. Today, we've got the Prime Minister, only a few days later, saying, oh, I can't even, we might not even be able to afford the triple lock if you vote to leave. W what's happening? Well, what makes it doubly confusing is that he, it was Cameron above anyone else who was incredibly possessive over the pension commitment and the pension of benefit commitment in the previous parliament. So even when he came under internal lobbying to soften the policy, to create fiscal room to maybe soften the cuts elsewhere, he was resisting it. So he it, 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 it deserves criticism now for seemingly uh, weakening the position. But in many ways, Cameron himself is the least important Remain politician for the next 11 days, because they need Labour voters to vote by a margin of at least two to one, if not three to one, for Remain to win this referendum. You don't do that by sending a prime minister they, they don't much like, and they voted against 13 months ago. So for the remaining 11 days, I think uh, Remain have to push Cameron less and Jeremy Corbyn more, if he's willing to do it. Or if not that, then Gordon Brown, who we saw last week do a video, Alan Johnson, Harriet Harman and a few other Labour figures, because that's where I think this referendum hinges now, those Labour voters, especially in the north of England. Well, if it's down to Labour now to pull it off, some of the Leave people may be opening the Champagne Alley. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a bit harsh. I think that Labour are in panic themselves. You know, the yeah. vast majority of Labour MPs want people to vote to remain, and reports today that some people were actually in tears when they saw the latest poll. But I think the Labour problem in some of their own heartlands actually goes deeper than this. I don't think it's whether or not David Cameron is campaigning or Jeremy Corbyn. I think it is that in some of those seats there are the biggest fears about immigration, and they want to see Labour talking their language. But for all that said, I think Chris and his colleagues also have questions to answer. You can't just dismiss all these reports, like the IFS report, saying there may be a £40 billion black hole. Yes, but, but, you know, most, most MPs, I think, uh, Labour MPs, I think it's only 15 who have come out for leave, but 40% of Labour voters are Eurosceptic. And those are also the people who are going to be switching straight to UKIP uh, come the next uh, set of elections. Uh, you know, UKIP already second party in the north of this country. If you're a very sensible Labour MP, you should be keeping very quiet about uh, Remain right now just briefly Chris Gray isn't the biggest danger you face is that in most referenda in the final 10 days there's a swing to the status quo that the status quo always has a built-in advantage Scottish referendum the AV referendum and so on. Don't, don't you risk that still well, I mean, we've got to make sure that that doesn't happen. We've got to campaign uh, relentlessly over the last, the, the last 10 days. We've got to keep getting the messages across about immigration. We've got uh, uh, new revelations in the Sunday Times today about the discussions taking place between the European Union and Turkey. Uh, you're going to be dealing later in the programme with this wave of more Europe that is waiting to come after the 23rd of June. There are all kinds of things being stored up by different parts of the European Union, by dip different parts of the diplomatic structure that are going to hit okay. our airwaves the moment well. if we do, we vote to remain. And that's one of the reasons I very much hope people will realise that more Europe is on the way and therefore they need to vote to leave. Well, we are going indeed to be looking at that, but you're not going away yet. Last week, we had campaigners for in and out interrogate each other. And we're going to repeat it today. It was such a success. The Conservative leader of the House of Commons, Chris Grayling, you've just seen, he wants to leave. And we've also got the Labour MP, Mary Cray, who's campaigning to remain. Now, they'll put each other on the spot. I'll just sit back and watch, maybe have a cup of tea. A short while ago, they tossed a coin to see who would get to go first. Mary was the winner or loser, depending on your point of view. And she's chosen to cross-examine Chris. So... 
before we start. Let's see Chris's pitch to undecided voters as to why they should vote to leave. In 10 days' time, we're going to be taking the biggest decision this country's taken for a generation. Should we remain or should we leave? And what will be our future relationship with Europe, given the fact we're already the biggest customer for European products like these ones? When you take your decision, I want you to ask yourself one simple question. Do I want to live in a country that's free to take its own decisions in the interests of its people? Or am I happy to be in a country that's given up control over key decisions that affect all of our futures? We've already given up control over a whole variety of areas of crucial importance to us. We're not allowed to forge our own free trade agreements with our own Commonwealth partners. We're not allowed to set limits on the number of people who come and live and work here and ease immigration pressures on the UK. All of that's happened already and there's more to come. And at the same time, we're spending a fortune on being part of the EU. Our contribution is £350 million overall every week. We only see half of that money back, money that could be spent on our priorities like the National Health Service and cutting your fuel bills. And if you've got any worries that if you vote to leave on the 23rd of June that it might not be business as usual, well, come on. The Germans are still going to carry on selling us these cars. The French are still going to sell us their wines and cheeses. But what we will have done is taken back control of our country. We will be in charge of the key decisions that matter to all of our futures. We'll be a properly independent country again. And that's what I want for all our children and grandchildren. So here are Chris Grayling and Mary Cray. Just to explain the rules, Mary has seven minutes to interrogate Chris. Mary can only ask questions. Chris can only give answers. Mary, your time starts now. Thanks, thanks, Andrew. Um, Chris, Vote Leave have claimed that EU regulations cost businesses £600 million a week. But that figure doesn't take into account the benefits of the regulations, does it? Well, the key issue for most businesses in this country, you have to remember that most businesses do no trade at all within the European Union. Most operate just within the United Kingdom. Yet they are all subject to the regulations, to the box ticking that uh, international businesses have to deal with. Because they're typically small businesses, they don't have the staff, they don't have the compliance departments to do it. So it places a huge extra cost on small business. And I've talked to small businesses up and down the country, and again and again they tell me that they are having to do box ticking, form filling, that adds nothing to the quality of their business, nothing to the environment that their workers operate in, but takes a huge amount of time and money that could be spent on hiring more people to be productive. Well, those, that, that same report shows these measures have a net benefit to the UK, so we won't be saving £600 million a week if we leave, will we? Well, the issue is not there isn't a cash saving of £600 million a week. What you do is you free up business to do new things. You free up business to take advantage of new opportunities. So on day one, you don't just save £600 million on the spot, but as we gain the freedom to reduce the burden of regulation on small business, not to reduce workers' rights, not to make workplaces more dangerous, but actually just to end some of the box ticking, the form filling that comes from Brussels, then those businesses have more time to go out and sell, more You've time said to that, develop that new products. That figure includes the costs of rights at work, the right to four weeks paid holiday a year, paid maternity leave and equal pay for part-time fixed term and agency workers. So which of those rights would you scrap? Well, we've always been better than the rest of the European Union at workers' rights, but let me give you a practical example of the kind of thing I wouldn't do. After the Gulf of Mexico oil disaster, even though we had the world's best safety standards in the North Sea, the European Union decided to rewrite them. No benefit to safety, no benefit to the businesses, but at a time when jobs are being lost in the North Sea, companies that are already dealing with tough times have had to deal with extra costs to no benefit at all except to keep bureaucrats in Brussels happy. Well, Surely you, that's not sensible. So you, you've been clear then, we wouldn't save £600 million a week from, from leaving the EU. Well, we saved money you, from you leaving the EU. You just said that. So hundreds of thousands of British women lost tens of thousands of pounds when your government changed the qualifying age for the state pension in 2011. So why should women trust you to protect their rights at work? Well, both of our parties have done that. Both of us have had to make changes. You the retirement the ages. In 2011. Both of us, it was the Labour Party who started changing the state retirement age, and we've, we've, we've both chosen to do that because 
the life expectancy of people in this country is rising. Uh, and inevitably, as pension ages or as retirement years become longer and longer, it becomes more of a challenge for us in, as a nation. And both we and the Labour Party at different times in government have said, because of that, we have to raise the state retirement age. And as a great champion of equalities, Mary, you would surely agree also now in today's world, it's sensible for men and women to retire at the same age. Um, I want to move on to what you said about the Commonwealth. We do more trade with Ireland than we do with all 53 Commonwealth countries put together. But your proposals, would um, mean that we'd have to have a new land border between a European Union nation, Ireland, and Northern Ireland. How will that help things? Well, I don't buy that at all. We've had the common travel area between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland since 1923, since before the European Union was even dreamed of by anybody. There is absolutely no reason for that to change. We will still have an open border. The issue is about legally being able to live and work in the United Kingdom, legally being able to get a national insurance number, legally being able to register for state support. That, that is something we can control. Creates an, uh, that creates a backdoor for EU migrants to come into Northern Ireland. And Bertie Ahern, the former, former Irish Prime Minister, has criticised Theresa Villiers talking about that uh, travel agreement because he says we're not talking about freedom of movement between the Irish and British, we're talking about EU citizens and non-EU nations um, still seeking a way into Britain. He said smuggling would undergo a revival, endless profit-making opportunities for subversives and organised criminals. Well, you're talking about illegal immigration. What I'm talking about is a situation where we have 77,000 people a year arriving at Victoria Coach Station or Luton Airport just to look for a job. Now, my I'm personal talking about view, Northern Ireland and the border there. Does, we've got 200 but, roads between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Are you going to have an army of bureaucrats checking the passports there? No, we never have. Since 1923, we've had a common travel area. But the issue is, if you're a European Union citizen who crosses the border into Northern Ireland and seeks to get a job, if you don't have the right to work here after we've left, if we've set rules in place that say, for example, you have to demonstrate you have a job before you come to the United Kingdom, then you won't be able to get a national insurance number. You won't be able to work illegally or work legally okay what is your alternative economic plan do you still want the UK to be like Switzerland I want the UK to be like the UK you have to bear in mind that the reason that we will do a trade deal with the rest of the European Union the reason we will carry on trading freely is actually because we buy more from them than they buy from us we are their biggest customer I buy more after from we leave the European can I just Union come back on that I buy more from Lidl than they buy from me. But I would say that the economic power in that relationship is with Lidl, not with me. We, we send 44% of our exports to the European Union. They send just 8% of our exports to us. Where is the power in that relationship? Well, with think, them or with us? Well, I think the economic power is with you, the consumer, because you can go to Tesco if you don't like Lidl. In what world would the French say to their farmers, for whom we are the biggest market, crucial market, that we are going to endanger your livelihoods by taking away your ability to sell your products in the United Kingdom. We represent 17% of the EU's exports outside the European Union. Why on earth would they put that in danger? Five Patrick, million European Union jobs depend on you and me and other British consumers. Why would they risk those jobs? Patrick Minford, one of your Vote Leave economists, has said that a vote to leave would mostly eliminate Britain's manufacturing sector and Michael Gove has said he can't guarantee that no one would lose their job. Are you happy with 18% of the British economy potentially um, stopping happening? Well, I mean, I simply don't accept. There are plenty of people coming well, he's one of your vote-leave economists, a leading vote-leave economist. I don't accept that. But let's look at those who Patrick are Patrick Minford is wrong. Uh, on this, yes, I think he is. Um, and let's be clear. I is think Michael that Gove wrong when he says he can't guarantee everyone's well, yeah, job? Look at Anthony Bamford, who is probably Britain's no, best-known manufacturer, in the cabinet, who is Michael saying we Gove. should leave. Michael Gove, your colleague in the Cabinet, has said he can't guarantee everyone's job. He's right, isn't he? Well, Michael Gove said he couldn't guarantee the jobs of 70-something members of the European Parliament, British members of the European Parliament and the European Commissioner. He's absolutely right with that. Uh, and I'm campaigning with people who are currently serving in the European Parliament who are trying to put themselves out of work. But on manufacturing, look at Anthony Bamford, look at James Dyson. These are people who are captains of our industries saying we should stay. Oh, saying we should leave. Um, Chris, have you ever joined a gym? Uh, I've never joined a gym. I've been to a gym on okay, occasion. That's, but, that's uh, good to know. If you, I see you're an on, I see from your register of interest, you're an honorary member of the RAC club. If a member cancelled their membership on Monday and then turned up on Friday morning expecting to use the swimming pool and the nice dining facilities, what do you think the other members would say? But the point you're missing is that no, what we would they are... say? Do, if you, if you cancel your £1,500 a year membership... We're going to have membership. to leave it there, I'm afraid, if simply in the interest of fairness, so that the time is the same. It's now the turn of Mary to be cross-examined. But first, let's have a look at her pitch to undecided voters as to why they should vote to remain. In 1940, Churchill urged towns and cities across the UK to fundraise for the war effort. Two towns just outside Wakefield, Horbury and Osset, heeded that call 
and raised enough money to buy their own Spitfire. Polish pilot Joseph Bondar flew that plane in the Royal Air Force, shooting down four German planes before he lost his life over France. Joseph's bravery and that of thousands of other Eastern European and Commonwealth servicemen is commemorated at this memorial. In a thousand years of European history, we've had just 70 years of peace, largely down to the European Union. Three million British jobs and £226 billion of British exports depend on our membership of the European Union. And the pressures on our NHS, schools and housing is not caused by European immigration, but by a hard right Tory government failing to fund and staff the NHS, cutting budgets for schools and overseeing the lowest level of peacetime house building since the 1920s. So when you vote on June 23rd, remember Josef Bondar, a Polish immigrant shot down over France for the freedoms we enjoy today. Remember too that the people that want us to leave are not our friends and allies in the United States and Europe, but right-wing politicians, Donald Trump, Marine Le Pen from France's National Front and Vladimir Putin. Ask yourself, is that a risk you're willing to take with your children's and grandchildren's futures in this battle for Britain? So as before, Chris, you have seven minutes to question Mary. Off you go. So Mary, the trade figures published last week show we have the biggest ever trade deficit uh, within the European Union. Why do you think our trading position in Europe has become so much worse while we've been part of the single market? I think it's really important that we stay in the European Union. It give us, gives us the largest domestic um, market in the world, a market of 500 million people. And as I said to you when I asked about the Lidl purchasing power, it's really important that we stay because 80% of our economy depends on services, freely traded, and 20% um, of our economy is manufacturing. Both of those sectors would be put at risk with a vote to leave and that is not a risk that I'm prepared to take with people's futures. But you didn't answer my question, why do you think our trading position has progressively got worse and worse over the years as part of the single market? I think our economy is changing, we've had a very big recession in the last um, six years and we've also had, no offence to you Chris, but six years of Conservative government so um, I, I think that Britain is better off, safer and more secure as part of the European Union and the, the issue around trading figures is do we create create more jobs, do we create more, more growth and more investment by remaining or do we, are we, do we take this leap in the dark, this risky leap in the dark with our security, with our prosperity and our future? But our trade position was getting worse even in the Labour years. It's been getting worse year and year and year and uh, while we've been part of the single market. So why is that? Well, the trade position is that we do more trade with Ireland than we do with all 53 members of the Commonwealth and that is something that your your campaign is wanting to put at risk. I don't think that that's a risk we can take. I think it's really important that we continue to stay in. It's really important that we work on closing that trade deficit but what we mustn't do is wreck our economy, have a new recession by a vote to leave which is what every single economic forecaster has said would happen if we were to have a vote to leave. That would trigger a recession and when that happens the economy shrinks and the trade deficit would get much much worse and of course we wouldn't be in the club we would be outside the club and they would be telling us what rules we would be abiding by and that trade gap would grow. So why did the European Union help make our trade position worse by paying Ford to move the production of Ford transit vans from Southampton to Turkey? I don't know what, what the Europe, I, I don't know the European Union paying forward to move production, but what's clear is that well, in a globalised world, to Turkey, in uh, a globalised world, in order to move the production of transit vans from Southampton to Turkey, something that's helped contribute to making our trade position even worse. Why did they pay for that? I don't accept that they did pay for that. I don't know about those details, but what I do know is in a globalised world, global companies like Hitachi, Nissan, Toyota, General Motors are looking at this. Uh, referendum, they're making decisions and we've got the Hitachi investment in the northeast of England, 90 million pounds of investment and they're thinking if we are no longer a gateway to the European Union, that market of 500 million people, we will not receive for foreign direct investment into our economy and that would, would harm jobs, growth and the economy of the UK. 
So let's look at that market of 500 million people. Why do you think unemployment for, amongst young people in Spain is now around 50%? I think that um, un unemployment in Spain, in Italy and Greece is unacceptably high. And I think that in some cases that is because there are structural factors at work. Um, when I was working in Brussels 25 years ago, the unemployment rate was always double the adult unemployment rate. And there has been structurally very high levels of unemployment in those countries. But there is also, uh, um, you know, the austerity policies that have been um, pursued um, by um, by the European Union and there have been very there have been also imbalances in those markets so Spain had a, a market that was based very much on selling houses Greece had an economy where nobody really collected taxes properly and so these structural weaknesses have been shown up by the 2008 recession and that that has led to consequences so let me change subject and ask you a simple question. Are you in favour of the United Kingdom having the ability to set limits on the number of EU citizens who come and live and work here? Uh, what I want us to do is have access to the single market. We are outside of the passport-free uh, Schengen zone. We are not part of Europe's asylum policy, so we choose the number of asylum seekers that come to this country and we, and we have control, your government has control, over who comes here from outside the EU. And there is more migration from outside the European Union than there is um, from within the European Union. So the question is, um, that free movement of people is, is, is one of the factors that gives us access to the market. People have concerns about immigration, but do we throw the baby out with the bathwater and wreck our economy uh, with a vote to leave? You didn't really answer my question, and I'm sure there'll be people in Wakefield interested in this. Are you in favour of the United Kingdom having any ability at all to set limits on the number of people who move from elsewhere in the European Union to live and work here? I would like us... Um, your your, your Prime Minister has negotiated an opt-out um, so that we that people who come here from the European Union have to now put in contribute to our economy for four years before they can ac access um, housing social social benefits etc and I think the um, that is that is welcome and I also think it's important that uh, your government starts making the investment in our NHS in our housing and in our schools that we need in order to deal with the people that are coming here there are more people as I said coming here from outside the European Union than from inside the European Union. You have control of that. Why are you not stopping it? Well, do you think, let's give a specific example, do you think people should be able to come from elsewhere in the European Union just to look for a job? There are 77,000 people each year who turn up at Victoria Coach Station or Luton Airport just to look for a job. Do you think that's OK? Or do you think we should say you have to have a job before you come here? I think that we have um, over a million British people living in Spain and they've chosen to... Um, to, to make their uh, retirements there, to, to go and live and work there. We have uh, around 2 million British citizens who've chosen to go live, work and invest in other European Union countries. When people come here to look for work, they look for work and they generally find it. And we know from the evidence that they put more into our economy than they take out from taxes. So to be clear, you're happy that people are, should be free to come from elsewhere in the European Union in unlimited numbers to look for a job here? You, I've said that there are more people coming from outside the European Union, which given visas by your government, than, than within the European Union. And I think that people make a contribution to our economy. What we don't want to do in terms of tackling immigration is to throw the baby out with the bathwater, um, wreck the economy. That would mean less money for public sector um, services, NHS education and housing and a weaker economy. So you're happy that there should be no limits on the number of people who come and live and work here? You, more people come from outside the EU than, than come from inside. And we will leave it there. Our time is gone. I thank you both uh, for that interrogation of each other. I've been getting away with it all.